So in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to pray to the Father for our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And oftentimes we think of that daily bread like, I don't have anything, please give me a little bit of something. Father, just give me a little bit of bread. But another way to look at it, which is probably a bit more accurate, is that I have so much to just want to manifest in my life and that there's so much I could do, think, have, experience, that God, please just give me a little bit of bread, just my little bit for today. And the reason why I say it's probably more accurate is because that word daily, when translated from the Greek, is epousion, which is not actually daily or anything like it. And most scholars agree that it's a bad translation. Epousion is more like super substantial or super abundant. So really what he's asking us to pray is God, please give us from the super abundance, the super substantial, the amazing amount of overwhelming love that you have for us, but just, just a little bit, just a little bit. Give us this day just a little bit of our super substantial nourishment. Uh, I think because as human beings, living with the stamp of God, living as an image of God, we can become very inflated if we're not very careful. God energy is so powerful that if we try to take it all in, we'll be destroyed. And you see this in the Old Testament where uh, a couple of different examples, one of which is with the Ark of the Covenant, where some of the priestly guys who are carrying it around actually touch it. And, you know, they, they said that God was in there. They touch it. And God says, don't touch the Ark. Two guys touch it and they die instantly. <laughs> they got the super abundance, but it wasn't a little daily dose. They got a bunch of it right away and it just shocked them and they died. That's God energy. I'm going to talk about that word energy in a moment here today because we often tend to think of that as a new age term, but it's not. It's very Christian, very orthodox Christian. I'll show you why in a moment. But also when Moses speaks with God, uh, a couple of things happens with him. He was the friend of God. I think that's even what Moses mean. The friend of God, uh, a couple a couple of weird things were like, Moses was like, hey, God, show me yourself. And God's like, whoa, no, 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 no. Too much super abundance. There's, it's super substantial. You can't handle it all. What, what is something that's substantial? It's something that's enough? Super means more than enough. So Moses, so God is like telling Moses, yeah, no, 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 no. I'll show you my backside. Meaning, and it's funny because I think there's a picture from Michelangelo where like God's flying away from Moses and you see his butt. <laughs> but meaning, I will show you a part of myself. I will show you some aspect of myself, which isn't my straight up. You're not going to see me straight on. You're not going to get God straight on. That's why all the language that we use, you know, it's tough. It's tough. Anytime we use language, you're trying to collapse the infinite into the finite and we fail. And it doesn't matter who or how, what tradition. I don't care if it's Christian. I don't care if it's, if it's Jungian. It doesn't matter. Whatever language you're using fails. It absolutely fails every single time. And God is saying, you can't handle me head on. Give me just my little bit of substantial bread. Just, I just want substantial, a little bit couple other instances, you know, I'm going to try to weave in the Bible here a little bit today. Uh, I want to go science. I want to go Bible. I want to go wide. I want to go deep. And we're going to have a lot of fun here. So and it's going to be very helpful and enlightening. And I'm going to get right down to the root of what I really want to dive into with you over the course of the next few weeks, which is bioenergetics. So I'm still sort of up in the clouds here with the things that we're going to be talking about. Obviously, I just jumped off from the cloud. Uh, but I want to get down to practicals, basics. I want to get right down to what to do with our body and breathing, right? Old Elliot Hull's talking about breathing into your balls. That's a very spiritual act. We talked about the breath being pneuma or um, spirit, ruha, I think, in, in um, the, the language of the Bible. So anyway, so let's come back to 
give us this day our daily bread. So I ask the Lord today to help me show you just a little bit, just a daily dose of the super substantial that is being pouring through me that you get to receive here. So I do this for me because I will be overwhelmed. I am overwhelmed. I've been overwhelmed with the amount of amazing teachings I want to bring forth to you. And, and when I say teachings, I mean more musings. They're, they're, they're more ideas that I wrestle with and play with. Oh, which reminds me, I, got, I lost track. Yeah, and then in the Bible also when I think uh, Jacob is wrestling with God and he's like, tell me your name. Like, like let me just get you. I just want to get you, is what basically Jacob is saying. I think it's Jacob. Jacob or Isaac is wrestling with God, right? And God's like, I am, buddy. He's like, I am. Just leave it at that, right? I mean, what a based answer. God is like, ah, 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 you ain't going to get my name. I am, right? So anyway, we're going to take, <laughs> we're going to try our best in just the way I can do it, you know, to bring this all down to earth for us. And once again, I'll make a claim that I'm making no claims. Once again, I'll make it be known that none of this is, none of this is definitive. I'm, I'm trying my best and I think we all fail. Everybody's failed. I don't think anybody has nailed this well. But I have interdisciplinary ideas that I want to bring all together. And um, so what are those interdisciplinary ideas? Where, am I gonna, where do you hear me getting some of this language? So I'll be completely transparent. Most of this rabbit hole began with me through bioenergetics. So very bodily, and we're gonna get to that, but we still gotta go high. Very bodily, very embodied. Ultimately, that's where we're gonna go. I'm gonna go really deep there because that's what I am. I'm a body coach, I'm a strength coach, I'm a physical trainer. But, but if we know that we are made in the likeness and image of God, how dare I manipulate matter without understanding the pattern? <laughs> right? It doesn't make any sense. How can we work with one end of the spectrum and not mess with the other end of the spectrum? Right? We're a spectrum. We're a spectrum. And you're going to notice, you're going to see that in a lot of what I'm going to show here today. We are the pattern in the matter. Right? We are the father in the son. That's Jesus Christ. His, that's what his example is. Right? The Father in the Son, and the Son is in us, right? I got Bible verses to prove it, if that is your jam. So that's where we want to go. Bioenergetics, biology, we're going to talk physical, but we got to go high first. Language, most, most of my language then is Jungian, Neo-Jungian, dare I say New Age, but I don't say New Age because New Age leaves, leaves out a lot of really important things. New Age leaves out any sense of evil or perversion or hell, right? These like it's it's a little too poly poly what is the word? Pollyanna. It's a little too Pollyanna. A lot of New Age stuff. It's all hippie stuff. It's all you know what I'm saying? They get some things right, but but it's not complete. And everything, nothing is the truth in its fullness. And I think personally, the Catholic faith comes to the closest, comes the closest to the f truth in our fullness. And so take it for what it will, but I'm going to give you my reasons why. And so that's where you're, I'm also getting a lot of my language. Most of my language, so if we want to go back down the ladder, Catholic, Jungian, bioenergetic. That's, and I'm, and I'm, make, I'm attempting with just a little substantial bread today, just not super substantial, just a little bit, a little bit to take that synthesis and deliver it to you in a way that gives you a big picture of where we'll be going when it comes to the root, right? Bioenergetics. So that being said, we're 10 minutes in and obviously we're just going to roll. So let's begin. Last week, uh, we spoke about the numinous. We spoke about the collective. We spoke about various different ways to describe God, but they all fail. They're all aspects of something we don't understand and we'll never understand. You'll only get to see the backside. What's the backside? The ass. And so everything that I say, every, every term that 
Carl Jung uses. Even words in the Bible, they have to be collapsed into third dimension. And that turns it into an ass. Every word, even the word God. We profane God when we use the word God. That's why I think he's in the first commandment is, you know, don't take my name in vain. Meaning like, yo, you're just talking about stuff, but I don't think you really know what you're talking about. You're just using these words and you think that's me, but that's not me. I think that's what it means, don't use my word name in vain. You know, like when people will say, like, don't say, you know, OMG, right? Oh, my, oh, you don't say that. And they're like, oh, you're cursing. I'm not so sure God's that shallow. It's more like, hey, you think you know what you're talking about because, you're, because we're so prideful that now you're, now you're using my name in vain, right? I don't think God's against words. It's against your association with those words. Oh, you think that's what that word is. But it's just a word. It's just a word. And so everything that I'm saying is pure ass when it comes to God, right? Shows you your backside. It's just backside stuff, right? And so, but we do get the name. We do get the name in, in the Bible. So I'll use it, Yahweh, Yahweh. And Yahweh, Yahweh, I believe is the term that is used when God speaks to Jacob and says, I am. Basically, Yahweh means I am. I am or is. He is. He is. Yahweh, he is. And uh, anybody who's like, you know, anti-God, atheist sort of, I understand why you would be that way because most of what people associate with God, like a big man in the sky or like some tyrant that's ruling us from beyond, <laughs> that's not it. If, 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 if Yahweh is the God that Christians are speaking of, then it's pure isness. It's pure being. God is pure being. Pure being. That means the seat of creation. Whatever you could fathom scientifically, yeah, that's God. If you say all kinds of quantum physics stuff, yeah, that's God. Whatever, and I'm not, this is not pantheism, because that's saying that all these things are God. No, there's the creations of the creator, but the seat of all creation is God the Father. Pattern. We're going to talk about that here, that word in a moment. It's a beautiful word. It's an amazing word. God the Father. Give me a moment. Okay. So, we started here, Yahweh, the breath. Remember I talked to you about that? That's the breath. It's... It's the name of God with no vowels. Amazing stuff because we're going to come back to it. I love this infinity symbol and this zero here. I want to work with some numbers and shapes here today, obviously, as you can see. But uh, a zero is not nothing. <laughs> In fact, a zero is the most full thing there possibly is. Because everything emanates from a no thing. Everything comes from a no thing. For anything to be, it must emerge from no thing. That's what nothing is. And, and nothing in this context, especially when you take it and you turn it this way and turn it into affinity, right? That's what it is. That's what a zero is, is pure potential. We spoke about that last week. Pure potential. A zero it has the highest potential of all numbers. It's the most powerful of all numbers. The minute you get a one, you collapse into reality and it's like ah, now you're losing something this is the fullness that's what it represents that's what a zero that's what that O represents and then the turning on its side there the infinity symbol means it's never ending it's never ending fullness right once again it's the ass of what we're trying to describe but it's one way to see and to make sense of a lot of the crazy stuff I'm going to be talking about right now. But we have to begin with a, with a realm of pure potentiality. And you know that that realm of pure potentiality is the God of the Bible. Because if there's a creator, it has to have what it creates. So God has to be a person. You can't create something that you're not, right? You know what I'm saying? You have to have the qualities of anything that you can create. The creator is always greater than the creation. So if you're a scientist, you're above 
observing, manipulating. If you're, if you're a, a, a mechanic or you're an inventor or whatever it is that you're doing, you're working with, you're manipulating it, you have to have a mind above it. You have to have some quality of it. Even if you're a horticulturalist and, and, you're, and, you're, and you're building or you're, you're making plants, right? Or if you're a mechanic and you're building a car, you're building a car the all the mechanical structures and the intricate uh, integrations of all the different pieces represent, uh, I mean, a finely tuned automobile is a, is an ape, or how could you say it's a, it's a, it's a knockoff of a human being without any consciousness, of course, but all the mechanisms, there's a lot of mechanisms. So for a man to create mechanical things, he must be mechanical in some way, shape, or form. And we know that they're like just the word biomechanics, right? What do you mind knowing? It's mechanical, it's movement, mechanical. And so God, God is not just a nebulous nothing. It is very potent with the potential for everything, including us, right? So not here, that's not my point here for today is to try to convince you that there's a God, but I will assert that whatever you think God is, ass. Remember, he's just showing you his ass. So if you walk around pointing at ass and saying, oh, that's God, I was like, well, yeah, of course you don't believe in a God because you're pointing at an ass, right? I'll show you my backside. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I'm getting a kick out of that one. So don't try to make sense of it because you can't. You'll, like those guys that touched the Ark of the Covenant, you'll, you can't handle it. You'll blow up. You'll die. So we started up high and, you know, the, 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 the point here is to bring it down to earth. And so I, I use the term stepping down, stepping down God. If we're made in the likeness and image of God, that must mean that in some way, shape, or form we're a step down part of God, which all creation is, but, but human beings in particular have many of the qualities and characteristics of God that no other creature has. And I know there's a lot of like environmentalists that like try to like say that like, you know, animals are more sacred than we are, or like mother earth, like, you know, the earth is more sacred than we are. Or that um, I don't know if there are creatures on other planets or anything like that. But anybody who tries to diminish human beings has an agenda or it's their useful idiots that perpetuate the idea that I once heard someone say that we're a virus on the earth. Human beings are a virus on the earth. Wow. Science shows that that's not true. And also... Uh, I, I remember studying a course that was talking about the magnificence of the human body in particular. The human body, the, the size of the human body, it's interesting. We fit at the midpoint of the smallest thing in the universe and the largest thing in the universe. So if you, if you, if you, if you built a spectrum of like the biggest thing in the universe and the smallest thing in the universe, human beings are just right in the middle. Isn't that crazy? And as such, it gives us a vantage point to perceive from the highest, right, to the lowest, matter. We manipulate matter, but it's because we, we are, our antenna is working with pattern, right? We're, we're the, the human is sort of a, I use the word antenna, but more like a trans, a transmitter, like a, 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 tra a transformer, right? I'm looking outside, I look at my the electric, the, like a word, like a transformer. We step down energy. There needs to be a transformer before that power comes into my house because there's so much power coming through those power lines that they have to step it down. But that transformer is likened to a human being in that like, ooh, God's just, there's a lot of God energy that's possible. That's why human beings have infinite, infinite potential. Anything is possible, but if we don't have what Carl, well, one of Carl Jung's students, uh, Robert Moore calls a system self. We don't have a system self. The system self is sort of like an ego. 
And the body is the ego. The body, and, and I know that's kind of crazy. I'll explain another time. But if we don't have a system self, then that electricity that's coming through will destroy us. That's why there's a lot of psychosis. That's why there's a lot of you know, personality disorders. That's why there's a lot of anxiety. Because a lot of times we're not taught. And I'm, I'm right there with you. We're not taught how to embody all of that power. We're not taught how to responsibly relate to all that power, all that God energy, right? Even like in the Bible, it says, don't even touch it. Don't even touch it. So, you know, going back to the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. I think that trespass it could mean many different things, and it probably does, but one way to look at it is if it's if we're talking about super substantial bread, and we're asking God just to, hey, just give us a little bit because there's a, too much and I can't handle it. Um, forgive us our trespasses, I think has a lot to do with how we relate to that super substantial bread. There's two ways that, that people will sin, right? Will trans transgress having that just a little bit, meaning let me, let me be a transformer, let me be a human being, let me take it in and just, I only have this day, I only have today, right? I only have an hour or so to do this presentation. Ah, you know, I, I, and that's why hum, hum, humility is important. You know, I am not this thing that's coming in. Just give me my little daily bread. But I think forgive us our trespasses is how we relate to that super substantial, Nourishment, one of two ways. We can handle it in a inflated way or a deflated way. What do I mean? Meaning you could handle it and become anxious, right? And freak out, burn your, burn your, uh, burn your circuits, sort of like you know, a workaholic, right? It's coming in, I just gotta do it. I tend to lean, naturally I tend to lean on that side. I'm just gonna uh, fry my circuits. It's even evident in the kind of sports that I engage in. Like I'm just a firecracker, bang, bang, I'll explode. Pop both my biceps, bang, bang, right? I take the energy in and I just bah, explode. So forgive me, for, forgive me my trespasses, like over trespass, like trespassing on that, like not dealing, not relating to it responsibly is a trespass, right? Not, not, not being humble is a trespass against it. But then there's the other side, which is more of a depressive route, where it's like you shut down and you don't let it in. You're not letting God in. Anybody who's depressed, it's because they're not letting enough God energy in. Not allowing that daily bread, you know, give us our daily bread. That person is saying, oh, I just, I don't want the whole, I don't want the whole bread. I just want to nibble. I just want to nibble so they don't die, right? Because it's just too much, right? This is a, a fearful person then becoming a depressed person. But the, you have the opposite, the anxious person who will like, give it all to me. Give it all to me. So forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I think those who trespass against us are those that, well, judge how you're relating to it or try to, try to give their energy to you, right? That's called... Uh, um, when you project, they can do projection, you know what I'm saying? All kinds of different things. Forgive us our, day, our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. The temptation is to relate to God in one of those two unresourceful ways. Relating to it in a very inflated way, saying, I got this, I can do anything. I don't need anybody or anything but me. I can handle this. There's a lot of ego, right? Until you blow up. You think that you did it. That's another one, right? That's associated with it. And I, I, I'm familiar with that one. I'm familiar with both. Because once you blow up, once you have, once you inflate, what happens when you get to a certain point of inflation? You deflate. And then so the temptation for me, and I fell into the temptation, is to just, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to deal with it. I don't want to look at it. And, uh, I'm just going to ignore everybody and everything, and I'm just going to be comfortable here in my little cave because it's too much. It's too much. I felt like that for a long time. I felt like that for a very long time. Um, but here I am now, and because I finally have 
the humility, right? Oh, I'm so humble that I'm saying I'm humble, but you got to understand I'm humble because call it better, better yet call it humiliation because I've been so humiliated, <laughs> right? It's a better way to look at it, right? I've been humiliated. I've been humbled, right? Not bearing the banner of humble and saying, look at me, I'm so humble, right? Humble, to be humble is to just know the truth about yourself because when you think you're something bigger than you are, you think you're something smaller than you are, you're not being very humble. Even depressed people are, are egotistical maniacs because you're, you're not being very humble. And I've been there too. Not being humble, you're starting to think that it's all about you. You still think it's all about you. Being humble is, hey, I appreciate this. Thank you. I'll do the best that I can and I'll deal with it. So lead us not into temptation for dealing with God energy in an unresourceful, in a, in a unrespectful way, a disrespectful way. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Evil is the perversion, the perversion of God energy, right? The perversion of infinite possibilities, right? Whatever you want to call it, the, the perversion of Yahweh. We see a lot of perversion of Yahweh, tons of perversion of Yahweh and his incarnate being, Christ. Just look at Hollywood. That's pure evil. Evil, evil. So then that's the third part, right? You could relate to it like, uh, or like, ah, uh, both of which is related. You're actually relating with it in one way or another, but then taking it in and then inverting it, turning it into something else. That's evil. If you look at the word evil, I think if you turn it backwards, it's live. Live and evil. L-I-V-E, E-V-I-L, something like that, right? It's the opposite of life. It's an inversion. It's flipped, right? So we could take... What, and you see a lot of this with a lot of cults. I'm not going to call out any names, but we got a lot of like, you know, um, Hollywood cults. We got a lot of uh, like political cults. We got like our whole, our whole world, in essence, is run by a cult. And if you look at what a lot of these cults do, they have religious practices. Oh, they have religious practices and they mirror or they are inverted Christian practices. And you'd wonder why, too, because you're like, well, why don't you just mirror or, or why don't you just invert some other religion? Well, you want to take the most potent stuff and turn it around, right? So these, a lot of these cults, um, they, if you look at their practices, their rituals and their, you know, the way they practice their religion, a lot of it resembles... Catholicism in particular, because Catholicism retained the form and the symbolism uh, of the faith that Christ gave us. Um, a lot of other forms of Christianity threw all that stuff out. Like, oh, we don't need that. We don't need that stuff. So what we want to do is we want to take all that. And what we did last week was we stepped it down into four. I spoke to you guys about the powerful implications of the word, the number four. We talked about the four neurotransmitters. We talked about the four nucleotides. We talked about the four seasons. Like, if God is going to step himself down, right, in a way that is manifest, in a way that is uh, material, in a way that's tangible, um, in a way for us to understand, which this comes from Carl Jung, he says, the psyche is quadrated. So even in us, there's a quadration. And he likened that quadration more onto a pyramid or really a diamond because, because it's like this. And I'm not going to go too far into it, but this is, just imagine that this is a pyramid coming up to you this way. And then there are four sides. But then there's a bottom pyramid that has to do with what? The inversion, right? There's always a perversion. So there's an evil version of your king, warrior, magician, lover, if you will, right? An evil version of it, it's based on a over-relationship to it or a negation of it, just like I'm talking about. You're either inflated with it or you are if, in, deficient in it, right? So you got the top, which is, you know, which would be an inflation. And just think about like pyramids all throughout. Anthropologists have discovered that like there's, there's like 
hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of pyramids, like ancient pyramids throughout the world. I was watching a documentary about it not too long ago. Pretty powerful stuff. It always seems that it's, 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 it's in the unconscious, it's in the archetype, that there's this four-sided, four-faced reaching for God, stepping up to God, reaching up to God. It may even be somehow the Tower of Babel is represented in these pyramids. I don't know. That's a reaching up, right? Which is, which, which is good to a point, because going down is the perversion, but he says the diamond mind is the middle. So there's, the four, there's really eight, right? If you consider the mirror of it, there's eight. So we spoke about that. I'm not gonna go too far down that rabbit hole. But if we, if we take this, and we want to step down a little bit further. And when we're stepping this down, like we're talking high concept stuff. I think the idea of the Trinity, it starts to be an embodiment of God. I think we get a little bit more embodied with the number three. This is all straight from the Book of Hulls. So I'm making this stuff up. But the quadrated psyche, which is young, is, is very high concept stuff, though it's imprinted in our DNA. It's very high concept stuff, but it's not, it's not solely related to man, where the Trinity is solely related to man, because one, actually one part of the Trinity is Christ. But let me back up for a moment see, to help you understand what that means. So stepping it down to the three. Three now. Oh, so I know I've done this before in videos, and, and this is just me trying to understand stuff, fellas. Once again... Straight from the Book of Halls, I'm trying to understand stuff. I know that both ends of the spectrum will get mad at me. If you're still here with me, that means you're part of my soul tribe and you're vibing with what I'm saying. We're gonna talk about vibes too later on as well because it's not just a new age thing. It's a scientific thing and it's a actually very Christian thing. So the, num the number three, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So as Christians, we know that. And if you're a Christian and you don't know the sign of the cross, well, that was like the gang sign of the early, early church, right? And so we, and in that movement, we are branding ourselves as children of God. Because no other creature has this, this connection to the Father. And the Father, our knowing of the Father is here. No other creature can know the Father because it doesn't have a human brain. The only reason why we as human beings relate to this as something that we can, can even consider is purely human. Well, I was only considering no God. The Father, pattern, the Father. Why up here? Human, human head. This is it. This is the stamp of God right here. Right here. But also it goes further. And this area is important too. It's all important. Our whole body, like I said, it's like a, it, it's a, it's at a mechanical advantage in every single way. We're built like this cross. We're, it's crazy. And then we have something called the axis bone between the head and the body. So this, when we do this, we connect the head and the body. Christ is the father in the heart. So when we point to the heart, we say Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Son, the Son. And when I point to my Son, I'm even pointing to my solar plexus, if you will. Because it's associated with the, what, makes us a, what makes us a biological creature. God became incarnate because he had a heart. And to have a heart means that you have a vibration. Because it does this. It has a frequency to it. And you're breathing. And the thing that lets that breathing happen so that frequency can keep going is the solar plexus. That's why when we point here, we're talking about Christ, the name of the Father and the Son. And in a moment, I'm going to show you that Christ is in you. And I got, I got Bible verses to prove it. So we're made in the image of the Father. We have Christ in us, the Son. I have an organ that's even named after him. Name of the Father and the Son. The son is the heart. The father has no emotion. Christ lived as a man. He had, Christ lived an excruciating life. 
What does the word excruciating mean? So to live as a human being and to have emotions is excruciating. There's, it's painful, right? It's painful in a good way. You know when something's bittersweet? It's pain. It's feeling. And it's painful in a bad way because like, yo, step on your toe. It hurts. You feel it. Now that's just the, that's just the bottom rung of it. There's all kinds of emotional feeling, feelings. Excruciating means excrucia, crux means cross, from the cross. To be crucified, Christ was crucified. He was put on the cross, crux. What is crux? Cross. Crux, cruxy, crux is the crux of Mind, God, and body, the crux. If you notice Christ on the cross, if you look at the crucifix, and I think only Catholics use crucifixes, but I think you're missing something if you're Protestant, and you don't have a crucifix because it reminds us that that's me on the cross. Christ died for our sins. What does that mean? That means he's there to, sh to take your place. He is where you should be. To die to self, which is what? It's, his neck is right where that cross is. That's why this is the axis. You got the atlas and you got the axis. It's the axis, it's a bone over here. His neck is always on the axis, on that cross, that cross section, that crux between what? Spirit and material. So when we go Holy Spirit, oh man, hope I'm not losing you guys. When we go Holy Spirit, what I, I, I'm coming to think about the Holy Spirit, because this, if this is vertical, this is, this is God in man, God in Christ. But God, for God to be in Christ, Christ needs to be what? His animal nature, his human nature. But animal nature is, ver is horizontal, right? We have a horizontal nature to us, though we stand up on two feet. We relate to, in every sing, almost every single regard, physically, to all other animals, except that we stand up on two feet. There's a remnant of a horizontal nature to us. If, we, if it's true that we come from apes, which I don't think it's true, but apes, they're halfway. If you look at an ape, he's halfway. And some of the guys that go to the gym, they're halfway too, right? They're halfway. An ape is like this. An ape can hang out in the horizontal, and then he could come up to the top. When is he most powerful? When he's up here. You, you don't want to mess with him when he's up here. Because now he's lined up. We stand up tall. And is, there's advantages to it because it makes our antenna. It's like our, 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 our brain and nervous system. It's like the roots. Boom. Aim straight up so we can receive transmission from God, the Father. So we stand up tall. A couple of things that's associated with that that you know just color our whole human experience. But we are also one of the only, we're the only ones that have our genitals in the front. All other animals have their genitals in the back. We have our genitals in the front, and our heart is open and exposed. We're the only animals that hug, right? We come together. <laughs> just think about when you're embracing your wife. You come together, head, heart, and down below, balls, right? That part of our nature is our horizontal nature. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and I, I do the sign of the cross because I don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit at all, right? Um, it's just me trying to understand, and I could be wrong and I'm, I'm open to rebuke. Trying to understand the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in an animal way instinct. But in a human way, intuition, what does that mean? So God takes care of all the animals because there is a quality of the Holy Spirit, a, a, an animal quality. And I don't know if you call it the Holy Spirit, because, but there's a spirit in an animal that gives it, it's, it's an animal spirit. It's, it's an animal spirit. The animal has a spirit that allows it to, you know, have instinct. Like my dog knows when somebody's coming up the driveway, even though he's back there, he's got an instinct about it. My dog is on, he's not, he hasn't been um, snipped. He's still got his balls, right? What do they call it when they take the dog's balls off? Neutered. He never seen porn before in his life. 
<laughs> he never seen doggy porn. He never seen other dogs humping. But yet he knows that when he's around a female dog, he's, he's like, I don't understand, but for some reason I want to get behind you and do this. And I see him, I have to like stop him because he's, he's, uh, his sister is neutered. She's uh, spayed. So, and their dog, they're, you know, dogs, not, dogs are not thinking, hey, that's my sister, I don't want to bone her. He's just thinking, my hips are doing this thing and you look like a good place to go do it at. It's his instinct, it's his instinct is doing that. Human beings have an instinct also, but, what, but we can elevate it. He can't elevate it. We can elevate our instinct. Sexual transmutation, you know, semen retention, because I'm talking about sex right now, has a lot to do with that. A lot of that, a lot of that is taking that primal instinct and elevating it. And there's nothing too mystical about it. It's just not putting so much emphasis on your dick feelings, right? Breathing, your, breathing into your balls. Breathe your boner back into your body and that energy will fill you up with all kinds of ingenuity, power, cognitive power, emotional power, physical prowess, right? Boxers don't bone before they fight. Why? Physical prowess. I need my seed. Holy Spirit is, I, 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 again, I'm trying to understand this. But it's an elevated form of instinct, which we call intuition. Intuition. Intuition is like instinct in that you're not consciously aware, but you got a feeling. You got a hunch. It's a feeling. It's like instinct is a feeling. My dog's feeling something. He's not feeling and I got to do something about it. Intuition is a feeling about something. Like I just have an intuition about this guy. He's no good. I have intuition about this guy. He's, he's good. Right? There's an intuition. We gotta, we gotta learn how to trust the Holy Spirit. And when I talk about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, if I get to it, but you know that you're dealing with not just animal instinct or your ego when it's manifesting as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Is that it? Nine. That's how you know that you're dealing with pure God grace. Not, you know, I got a, I got a boner on, so uh, I think God's telling me to have an affair with this girl. No, that's not. That's your instinct, buddy. It ain't your intuition. It's not a fruit from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't contain the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So we're talking four. We, we're talking three. Part of the human brain also, so we talk Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which is symbolic. And I, a part of why I think religion is important, particular Christianity, in particular Christianity, because it's an incarnate faith. Christi what makes Christianity so useful, so much more useful than any other religion, is Christ. Why? Because God humbled himself and became man. That's Philippians 2, 6, 8. God humbled himself and became man. So that means it gives us hope. It gives us faith. He shows us the way straight from God. And why is that important for us and nobody else? Because we're made in the likeness and image. So the brain, the human brain, the human brain. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But you got the Father, which is the neocortex. The neocortex, a human brain. Only the human has a neocortex. It's that big part on top of the brain. It's like a big cap that makes our head so damn big, right? We get the biggest heads. That's why when a woman has, you know, a part of what makes a woman's body very different is the size of her hips. Because she, as a human woman, she got to push a big bald head out of her puss. Right? A giant head got to come out of there because we're carrying around a neocortex, which is, which is our connection to God. I have so much more to say about that in terms of imagination, too. We're the only, we're the only, we're the only animal that can imagine. That's why we have a relationship with God, because it's through our imagination. It's not a bad thing. It's not a matter of saying, oh, God is imaginary. A lot of people, like, you don't, you don't realize the power of imagination. Imagination is, is, a, is a gift. 
And so to say your God is imaginary, it's like, well, yeah, he lives in here. I have the capacity to commune with him, communion with my God, right? And Christ has a lot to do with that too. But I'm just, I'm just talking about the human faculties, right? We have perception, we have intuition, we have imagination, we have memory, a different kind of memory than my dog's memory. Much different. It's human. It's, and it's why? Because of the neocortex. But we also have the cortex, right? Or the mammalian. We call this neo-mammalian. We got a neo-mammalian brain. We got a mammalian brain. Mammalian brain, the mammalian brain is like the heart brain. The head brain is like the cortex, the God brain, the father brain. The, the cortex is the heart brain. How, why can I say that the cortex is a heart brain is the sun pointing to the heart? Because it's associated with our limbic system. That's associated with feeling. And we know that that is unique to a, a subsection of creation because you could also say it's our, our mammalian brain because other mammals that care for their young have that too. So this is where we're more ape-like in that way. The ape don't have the neocortex, but he's got a, he's got a mammalian brain. And so they love their young, right? They nurture their young. They take care of their young. That's a sign that there's a heart brain in there. I'm just using that term, you know, that there's, a, there's, there's, there's that. And then we have what you would call even, if we're going to run with that theme, reptilian brain. You got a reptilian brain. That's your Abdullah Ablongata and the brain stem. I got alligators in my lake. Alligators have no feelings. They have no memory. They're just pure fighting and effing. Let me reproduce and reap what I sow. They just want to eat and eff, right? Try not to use bad words, <laughs> right? So it's fighting, effing, running, fight or flight. See what I'm saying? We have that too, that third brain. But when elevated, I think that's where our, our intuition comes from. Because intuition isn't logical. You see what I'm saying? So I'm just further elaborating on, the, on this trinity, that we're a trinity. We're also a trinity. We're a quadration, but one step down, and you know it's true because it's in the brain. This is psyche. Psyche is sort of above the brain. You can't, you can't, you can't grab the psyche. You can't dissect the psyche. You could, I mean, like Carl Jung tries to dissect it, but it's not a thing, right? It's not a thing. The psyche, thinking, feeling, being, doing, right? The, 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 but these are, these are infused. These are from above. This is right in here. The Trinity is on us. That's why we do this. I think we're, a part of what makes us in the likeness and image of God is this right here. This is a part of it. Father, head, son, heart, Holy Spirit, animal, intuition, fruits of the Holy Spirit. Boom. Understand it. And in Christ. And forgive me, Father, if I say anything that is wrong. I'm just trying to understand. I'm trying to deliver. And Christ is, check the two intersecting lines out. And I, I kind of spoke about this before. Christ is the intersection between the higher, right? Reaching for God. This is a vertical line, a vertical line. When you turn this on its side, it points up. A vertical line and a horizontal line, the animal nature. God so humbled himself that he poured... Let me get these Bible verses for you guys, right? God made was in likeness and image, right? John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word became flesh. That intersection, that intersection, word became flesh right here. It's the intersection between word, which is, what is word? A word is a pattern, right? A word is a pattern. If you don't pattern the, the letters out, right, as we use it, that each word is a pattern of letters. Word means, is pattern, logos, right? What is a logo? Logo is a, represented, is a representation of something. 
a logo, when you see the logo, McDonald's logo, that's not McDonald's. That's a logo that represents McDonald's. The word, the logos became flesh. It means he, be, we became, he became the real thing. He became the animal thing. Right? Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 8. It stated that Jesus, though being for, in the form of God, emptied himself and took the form of a servant, being born in human likeness. This verse emphasizes the humility and self-emptying nature of God. God allowed himself to be collapsed into reality. Now, was all of God in Christ? No, that's impossible. That's why Christ can still refer to the Father and be God. There is one thing. And then it goes even further. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Christ is in me. If Christ is God, help me understand this, anybody. If Christ is God, and as a Christian, you believe that, and there's ample reason to believe that, good reason to believe that, and it's a resourceful idea regardless. God is in Christ and Christ is in me. What does that mean? I'm made in the likeness and image of God. Okay, that's a good idea. That's from the beginning. But then in the fullness of time, he became man. And that man now his spirit lives in me. That's what Christ came to show. Christ came to fulfill Genesis 1.27. You're made in the likeness and image of God. My father. Right? And I'm not a Bible scholar. I, you know, I'm going to get better at it. I'm going to do my best. But just so you understand, where I'm coming from is that that's us. So what are we? And how does this relate to bioenergetics? So what are we, right? If we're a cross section, we're the cross section. We're the crucifix, right? We're on the crucifix. We're from the cross, living in this excruciating experience. Have you ever watched those like near death uh, videos on YouTube? Every single time one of them goes to heaven, they don't want to come back here because they're like, it's painful. To be human being is to, is to live on the cross. That's why Christ's example is so helpful. So what does that make us? And then how does this lead into breathing, moving, exercising, bioenergetics? So let's wrap it up with that. Pattern, where we get the word father. In Latin, when we, read, when we pray the Our Father, we say pater noster. Pater noster, pater, pater, pater. Pattern, we're the pattern in the matter. We're God in the flesh. The image of God, which is the pattern, is formed in matter. You know how, you know how, I think in the Bible it says that like he knew you when you were in your mother's stomach. He uh, knitted you together in your mother's womb, right? And then same thing with Christ. He came, he, he, God incarnated through Mary. I can't help but to think that the prefix ma, Mary, ma, mother, matter is all together. God came through matter, Mary, into the world. It's telling us about ourselves. It's telling us about Jesus Christ, yes, but it's telling us about ourselves. There's a lot that we get to know about ourselves because of Christ. Christ came and taught us a whole bunch just by his being. He came in through matter, pure matter. Pure Virgin Mary, through virgin material, right? That's a whole rabbit hole I could go down to. Form and substance. So Thomas Aquinas teaches that uh, all of the sacraments, the seven sacraments of the church, for something to be a sacrament, it has to be sacred. For something to be sacred, it must have both form and substance. Form is God, pattern. Pattern is form. If something is formed, it's formed after a pattern. Right? The form of a thing is its pattern. Substance is its matter. So the substance and uh, the form and a substance come together to create a sacrament. This is taught by Thomas Aquinas in the Summa, where he talks about the sacraments. 
Just think about the sacrament of marriage or, or, or the, the, the matrimony is what we call it. The sacrament of matrimony. The form is the Trinity. Man, woman, right? Even in this verse, he says, man, woman, I created them. So instantly God goes from one to two, right? How does it say it? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. He created them. So man and woman right from the beginning are one thing, right? Bottom line, he says it right there. Man and woman are one thing, but we're one thing in God. God the creator made man and woman. So marriage, the form is that relationship, that communion. We come from God, right? And that's why when two become one flesh, when a man takes his woman and a woman is with a man, they become one flesh. They're knit together through the, through the, through the, the glue of God. The substance are them, the two people. The two people are the substance because they're physical people. So this is a spiritual consideration. This is a physical consideration. And the two of them together make a sacrament. So anything that's sacred has to have both pattern and matter. If you have a sacred object, it means that there must be some spiritual meaning to it. There's some spiritual infusion with it. Catholics have the Holy Eucharist, have the reconciliation, have matrimony. These are all examples of sacraments. A sacramental is something that is, well, what's the word? Sentimental. Sentimental, sacramental. Sentiment means it comes from a feeling. Sacrament means that it comes, sacramental means that there's spirit associated with it. Something that's sentimental to you is of lower value than something that's sacramental to you. Do you see the difference? Sacred is sacred. And what makes something sacred, of course, is because spirit's associated with it. But a sacramental means that there's a sacrifice. The whole the word is, they're all together. A sacrifice. A sacrifice means that it had to go from pure potential into a thing. So there's nothing that's, that's sacramental and there's nothing that's here that exists without a sacrifice. Every human being is a sacrifice. When you blow your load in your wife, that's a, sacri that's a big sacrifice. I don't think we recognize just how powerful our seed is. That's a sacrifice. You sacrifice a part of yourself, your essence. Big time, energy, energy and essence. And that woman, she sacrifices nine months. For me to make this video, I had, I'm sacrificing a whole lot. I'm sacrificing my time, I'm sacrificing my energy, and I'm sacri sacrificing my sanity. I'm trying to make this stuff up. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to consolidate it through my system self so that it can be presented in a way that's understandable. Because I understand this. But to try to verbalize it, <laughs> All I'm giving you is ass. So, sacrament, sacred, sacrifice. If you're gonna have anything in your life, it requires a sacrifice because you're taking pure potential, I have a business idea, and then adding it to substance, whew, what's it gonna take? It's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some effort, it's gonna take some energy, it's gonna take some money, it's gonna take some sacrifices. Then that thing becomes sacred. Your business becomes sacred if you, if you approach it from that spiritual place and treat it reverentially. Even our sacral, I know I'm going, I'm going nuts right now. Your sacral area, right? Where you have your, uh, the bone, the sacral, sacral bone. I don't think it's, I don't think it's, um, I, these words, they're funny. Words are, are uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. Words point to things more than the word, right? God became the word. But so this is a very sacred area. Our, our, and why is the genitals, which we have the sacral bone that supports it, why is it called sacral? Why does it, why does it, have, what does it have to do with sacred, with uh, sacredness? Well, say, say sex is sacred, sacred. Maybe even that word sex comes from sacred because there's a sacrifice. Sex, S-E-X, is like, it sounds like a sacrificial word. There's an X there. Boom, right? What is an X? It marks the spot. That's where it's going to happen. And, and so there's a sacrifice 
in that you as a man and her and as a woman are pure sexual potential become one flesh and make that baby through the sacral area, sacral zone with your genitals to generate more people. We live in a degenerate world, which turns all these things, inverts all these things and makes them backwards. So form plus substance makes a sacrament. Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist is a sacrament, is a sacrament. Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist is just a little bit of bread, just a little bit of bread. I think sometimes, once again, as a Catholic, you know, there's, there's, it's rife with symbolism. And some people say, oh, that makes you pagan, but I don't think so. Because if you believe in Jesus, that means you're pagan too, because you're worshiping flesh. Christ is the flesh version of God. So to say, <laughs> just, it, it, you, you, you lose. To be a Christian and to say that's pagan, it doesn't, it doesn't relate. It doesn't relate. Because we are, Christianity is an incarnate faith. It's an incarnate faith. That means it's, in, it's carnal, physical. That's why statues and, and paintings, they're not sacrilegious. Worshiping them and thinking they're it, they're the God. And yeah, that's graven images. That's like, all right, well, you think that's the God, but it's not. It's, just a, it's a sacred image. You see what I'm saying? Energy and biology. So we get the word bioenergetics, and this is where I'm going to go with it. The, 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 the rest of this series, I'm going to be talking about bioenergetics. So those of you who are sticking around this long, like, you know, you want to know the why behind the why. And so, you know, thank you for joining me. But for me, like, I, I have, I, it may sound like I'm crazy. I have circular thinking. It doesn't mean, that, or I do have circular thinking. I'm kind of crazy. But I have circular thinking mean like I got to circle back to the beginning. Like I got to know why behind the why. I got to know why I'm doing what I'm doing and what's behind it. And so all this Yahweh talk and, you know, living from the cross uh, brings us to bioenergetics. And I'll tell you why it's so important because bioenergetics is so powerful that if there's no sacred component to it, it's going to hurt you. Like it hurt me. Bioenergetics help, uh, treated un respectfully, because what we're talking about is God and body, God body. If this is treated profanely, you're, gonna, you're messing with stuff that could hurt you. And I think this is why a lot of Christians are like, oh, you shouldn't do that kind of stuff. Because if, you're treating it without reverence. And I even think bioenergetics is very much like it's very much akin to exorcism. I'm not saying it's exorcism. I'm not saying that. But there's a lot of crossover. And the church always, is always taught that, you know, let exorcism and deliverance be done in an orderly fashion through the magisterium and then the, the, the church, the domestic church. You don't be trying to deliver people that you don't have authority over. To do this right, it means that you got to have authority. And you got to create sacred space. And you have to have containment, which is sacred space. I found the church, or the church found me, or I was, you know, my baptismal graces kicked in and became a containment for me to handle the crazy shit that was going on in my life because I was, I was introduced to and then dealt with bioenergetics in an unsacred way. But I have to sacrify it. I have to make it sacred. And it doesn't, I'm not trying to turn everybody into Christians. But if you're interested in bioenergetics, I don't think that you can go Body psychology without Jungian psychology. And Jung was into religion. Because Jung understand the, he understood the sacred. You got to understand the sacred. Right? If you deal with things and pretend like it's only profane, you fail. Because not only are you only getting half of it, but you don't get the protection. You don't get the spiritual protection that comes from the containment that the church provides. And the sacraments to support you along the way. Anyway, so energy and biology. Now, I know there's a lot of confusion about the word energy, and it, it, uh, I, a lot of New Age terms are just hijacked Christian terms. I'll tell you that right now, for sure. I kind of alluded to that before. But I'm going to tell you that energy, the term energies as it relates to God, is a very Christian 
understanding, very old Christian understanding. I'm going to read from the Orthodox Way by Bishop Callista Ware. And he, he refers to uh, St. Basil, who's like, you know, like a, like a third century, I think so. I don't know when St. Basil was, but St. Basil's old. Old church, like before, before we split up, before the East and West split and then the Protestant revolt. This is what Christians understood. God's essence versus energy. Now, God's essence is totally unknowable, but his energies are manifest. We know God because of energy, and that's the word that they use. That's what the word that Orthodox Christians use, energy. I'm not making this up, and it's not a New Age term. It's very Christian for those of you who are Christian and want to make sure that what I'm saying is, I'm not even going to say biblical, because, because the Bible is a tradition of the church. The Bible comes from the church. For something to be bi biblical, it has to be traditional, meaning the Bible came from the tradition of the church. The, 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 the Bible is not a tradition in itself. It came from something, right? So the traditions of the church, you want to go back. You want to go a little bit further beyond the Bible. Where did the Bible come from? Well, it came from a tradition that we keep a Bible. Oh, who are the people that, keep, that decide to keep a Bible? Well, Orthodox, Catholic Orthodox, Orthodox Catholic, right? They're the ones that maintain the hopefulness of the faith with all its ritual and symbolism and, you know, woo-woo energy talk, right? Mystical Christianity. I told you I was going to go there with it, right? So I love everybody, but, you know, I have to point, I got to point these things out. So energy. Here, listen to what Callista Ware says about energy. To indicate the two poles of God, and this, I mean, there's, there's thousands, hundreds of saints that that this comes from that are way smarter than I am or any, you know, Bible bumper. To indicate the two poles of God's relationship to us, unknown yet well-known, hidden yet revealed, the Orthodox tradition draws a distinction between the essence, nature, or inner being of God, on the one hand, and his energies, operations, or acts of power, on the other hand. St. Anathasius, he is outside all things according to his essence, but he is in all things through his acts of power. We know the essence through the energy, St. Basil affirms. No one has ever seen the essence of God, but we believe in the essence because we experience the energy. By the essence of God is meant his otherness. By his energies is meant his nearness. Because God is a mystery beyond our understanding, we shall never know his essence or inner being, either in this life or in the age to come. If we knew his divine essence, it would follow that we knew God the same way that he knows himself, and this we know can never, we can never do, since he is the creator and we are the created. But while God's inner essence is for ever beyond our comprehension, is therefore ever beyond our comprehension, his energies, grace, life, and power fill the whole universe and are directly accessible to us. His energies, grace, life, and power. Grace, energy, life, power inside biology, dust. Spirit in the body, in the dust. Bioenergetics. Bioenergetics is, links the two of them together. I could go on and on, but you get it. If you want to read this book, you can. So when it comes to that energy, God energy, how does God energy that we as Christians believe in and we know because we can experience it, how does it manifest? Pulsation. Pulsation. God energy, not his essence. We don't know his essence, but we experience his energy through pulsation. Everything in the created world pulsates. The entire earth. If you just, if I stand out here and I watch this tree over the course of one year, I'm going to watch it go in the spring and summer. In the winter, fall, fall and winter. 
and I speed it up, say I do six years, it's gonna go That's what the tree is doing. The tree is literally pulsating. In order to draw nutrition up, it's gotta pulsate. It, there's like peristaltic movements. In your digestive system, there are peristaltic movements that move your digested food down out your booty. I'm just showing you how nature pulsates. If you just stand here, if I just stand here, you know what's gonna be? If I just stand here for the next four days, you know what's gonna be? Bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. As I'm sitting here, as I'm standing here, you know what my heart's doing? Love dub, love dub, love dub. You're looking at me through this screen. You know what this screen is made up of? Digits, zeros and ones, literally digits to die. Zeros and ones, like the matrix. The whole matrix is made up of what? Digits. What is a pulsation? It pulses, heart pulses, lungs pulse, everything pulses. And you're, we're a pulsing mechanism. And this is so important when it comes to bioenergetics. A pulse is a frequency. What is the frequency? There's, there's the up and there's the now. There's the up, there's the systole and the diastole. There's the inhalation and the exhalation. That's a frequency. It, just the word frequent, like how frequently does it, like you know, there's a frequency to how many times the mailman comes or my garbage man comes. There's a frequency. He's here, he's gone. He's here, he's gone. He's here. There's a frequency. That's not a new age term. It's quantum physics because quantum physics tries to do what we're doing right here, which is like, wow, I think we could sort of kind of understand the energies of God. We could understand some laws that are associated with relating to God. Uh, not just the Ten Commandments. Those are moral laws. But there's also natural laws. We'll talk about that. Frequency, vibration. What is a vibration? It's a frequency. It's just, it's just the rate at which something is the frequency. Right? We're all on different frequencies. There are psychic frequencies. Telephones wouldn't work if there were no frequencies. You dial one number, you're on the frequency of your brother. You dial a number, then you're on the frequency of your mother. Science understands this stuff. Why would it work with phones but don't work with us? And we're higher creations than a freaking phone. We're created by the creator, the phone's created by us. The only reason why we could create the phone is because we have that in us. We have frequencies. You can't create what you don't have. That's why God, God is a person. <laughs> frequency, frequency, and then there are rates of frequency. But ultimately, God frequency, like it said in the Bible, he poured himself out, he humbled himself and became man. He goes from infinite potential down into became a man. The vibration scientifically goes from to it's vibrating, the smaller vibration, smaller vibration. When something is dense, there's a smaller vibration. It's bigger vibration, the higher it is. That's why there's different frequencies for sounds. You, you could hear sounds on a certain frequency, but at a certain point it gets so high only my dog can hear it. Dog can hear a dog whistle. That tells you that there's a frequency that you can't tap into. Hearing frequency. So breathing, breathing, heart beating, they're all associated with being. And when we are being in the smoothest frequency possible, you could say we're walking in grace. That means there's no hiccup. God, Adam was walking with God. God, Adam was in pure grace with God, fully graceful. We live in a fallen state because we got egos and so on and so forth. And I think God's, I think our body is probably, I think our body is different than Adam's body. When we fell into the third dimension, we lost sort of a light body. I think Adam probably had more of a light body, like Christ in the transmutation. I could be wrong. This is just, I'm making this stuff up. So, uh, for us, we want to be in that place where we have the most grace. And the way that grace shows up in your presentation to the world is through charisma. So when you ask me where 
what's the point of bioenergetics? It's getting your body and your mind so free and at such a calm but powerful frequency that you're charismatic. Where does the word charisma come from? Charism. Where does the word charism come from? It comes from charity. What is the word charity? It's love. When you are fully charismatic, you are, you are teeming with love, with God's love. In Christianity, there are various charismatic branches. I know in the Catholic Church, there's the charismatics. They are charismatic. What do they do? Basically, bioenergetics. If you look at like, um, well, the Quakers and Shakers, right? But also the um, Pentecostals. They call it the charismatic gifts. The charismatic gifts, right? Which is like when you are in such a, uh, when you're in such a communal frequency with God that they're, you know, prophesying, stuff like that. You know, some of the charismatic gifts, what are they? It's like prophesying, it's like, you know, uh, I can't think of them, but like, these are like kind of like psychic gifts. But also, I, you know, and I, and I want to go too far down that rabbit hole of charismatic gifts and all that, like charismatic graces. I mean, they're real. It's true. It's even, you know, through all, all of the faith. It's true. Best way to know them is by the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So that's why I have Galatians 5, 22 to 23 that I spoke about before. You know you're walking in full bioenergetic, what Alexander Lowen would call um, motility, when, you're li when, when you got the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You're walking in love. What is love? Charism, charisma, charity, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness. Gentleness and, and, and self-control. So that's where we're headed. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to be. That's what we're designed to be. We're designed to be walking in God's grace. Sanctifying grace. Exhibiting the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Living charismatically. Expressing ourselves with charisma. So that's it. That's all, y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed this video. I'll be back. Now, listen. Doing a lot of talking these past two videos. Over two hours now. Next video, I'm taking your questions. Next video, I'm taking your questions. So I know if you're watching to this end, you'll be one of the only guys that have questions. And I don't know who's going to watch it this long. But I think there might be some of y'all. Look at the last video. Look at this video. Come up with your questions. I want to, I want to pause for a moment because this was a lot. This is crazy. And I want to answer your questions. I want to dialogue with you guys a little bit. I don't want to, I, this is, you know, there's a lot of me spitting at the screen, but at the same time, there's got to be a dialogue. And I know that there, there are those of you out here who are fascinated with this stuff, interested in this stuff. And I'm going to go deep on bioenergetics. I have to go here first. Last time when I talked about the four different quadrants, we're talking about like the right side of the quadrant, right? And this is all gobbledygook too anyway. It's, they're all, they kind of cross over one another. Bioenergetics is a big crossover. I think we, I think we, you know, for lack of better terms, we kill more birds with one stone through bioenergetics. Spiritual, physical, emotional, and relational. Bioenergetics. Bioenergetics will do all that for us. We kill all those birds with one stone. We become the strongest version of ourselves through bioenergetics. But it's all encompassing. Posture has a lot to do with it. Breathing has a lot to do with it. Thinking has a lot to do with it. It's everything. Bioenergy. God body. Done.